by saying that it's a great honor for me today to introduce Jennifer Doudna to UC Davis. Um, Jennifer started her graduate studies at uh, Harvard with Jack Shostak, uh, where she obviously started her love of RNA. And uh, there she made some really important contributions to, to science, uh, one of which was really the first person to show that RNA could uh, catalyze the synthesis of a complementary RNA strand. And this was very important because really it, it was biochemical evidence towards the uh, RNA world. She then moved on to Colorado to work with Tom Cech, um, where she got interested in, in really, I think, RNA structure and looking at group one uh, self-splicing uh, ribozymes and introns. Uh, and there she helped to sort of identify the core of the, the intron um, the, and, and its structure. So basically from that she wanted to start her own lab and try and get high resolution structure um, of the group one ribozyme core. And I believe everyone told you that you were crazy to try and do that and that it was impossible. And so obviously Jennifer made it possible, got a crystal structure of the group one um, P4, P6 intron. Um, and really that really paved the way for, for the world to be able to go after difficult RNA structures. Um, she was obviously uh, made her mark with that and, and got many prizes and honors from that work, uh, one of which was election into the National Academy of Sciences before she was 40 years old. So it was very important work. Um, she then moved her lab to UC Davis, uh, the UC Davis, UC <laughs> Berkeley, we wish. Anytime, you're welcome. <laughs> That would be nice. Um, <laughs> UC Berkeley, where she set up her lab um, there and started continuing to think about structure and function of RNA, uh, looked at various viral RNAs and, and um, began to get interested in microRNAs and the RNAi pathway. And she continues to lead the field in, in structure and function of the RNAi world. But then along came CRISPR, and that's what we're going to hear about today where she really um, has done some very pioneering experiments in, in the world of CRISPR RNA and really looking at genome uh, editing, uh, editing uh, recombination and, um, and genome engineering. And so I fear you're moving into the DNA world, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's still an RNA machine. So um, thank you for coming, Jennifer, and we look forward to your seminar today. Well, thanks very much, Chris, for that really generous introduction, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming to the lecture and for the invitation to visit Davis. It's uh, been a really fun day, really enjoying it myself up here. Um, and I, I, what I'd like to do in, in the seminar today is I want to tell you about our work on CRISPR biology, and, and, uh, and particularly for the students and postdocs in the, in the audience, I, I would like to, I hope to give you a sense of how we've approached this project, to give you a sense of you know, sort of how we, how, we, how we go about doing uh, the science that we've done. And this is really, uh, for me, you know, has been a, a lifelong passion of trying to understand the, the, the biology of RNA molecules and figure out how they are involved in controlling the expression of genetic information. And that's really how we got involved in studying uh, CRISPR biology. So this, this is a field that, that started off um, about as obscure as, as one could imagine. So there was, I think, the first mention of, of these, uh, these repetitive loci of bacteria that have come to be called CRISPRs was in a paper in 1987 where a lab had noticed that at the end of a gene they were studying, there was a highly repetitive sequence. And they just made a mention of this in a, in a manuscript but didn't have, obviously, any idea at the time what these sequences might be doing. And, um, and these uh, CRISPRs came to my attention in around 2005 when there were uh, three papers that were published from three different bioinformatics groups investigating bacterial genomic uh, DNA sequences and reassembling these sequences. And I got a call one day in my lab at Berkeley from Jill Banfield, who's a colleague of mine on our campus who said that, um, that her lab and, and others who do this kind of metagenomic sequencing of bacterial uh, samples had discovered that many of these bacteria have in the, in the chromosome a highly repetitive 
set of sequences consisting of about a 40 base pair sequence repeated over and over shown in these black diamonds. And in between these repeated sequences were unique sequences of about the same length, 40 base pairs, but every one, every one of them different. And the remarkable thing published in these three papers that Jill brought to my attention was that uh, all three of these groups noticed that in many of these uh, bacterial samples, the sequences found in between the repeat sequences of these uh, CRISPR repetitive loci corresponded to sequences found in bacteriophage that could infect those bacteria. So it was a very interesting hint that these uh, repetitive sequences might somehow be involved in some kind of bacterial immune system, some mechanism that would allow these bugs to sense invaders that get into the cell and use the DNA information in those, in those uh, invading DNA sequences to help the cell somehow to defend against those, those invasions. But it, at the time, it was just a hypothesis. Nobody really knew if this was the case. And um, notably, Adjacent to these repetitive loci in organisms that have such, uh, such uh, loci, these CRISPR sequences, very typically are found um, genes that encode CRISPR-associated or Cas proteins. And, um, and so these together, it was hypothesized that these might somehow be involved in uh, some kind of uh, immunity system in, in bacteria. So, um, uh, Jill, I think, called me because, you know, we, we, in my lab, as Chris mentioned, we have been investigating RNA interference pathways and, and the sort of molecular mechanisms that allow eukaryotic cells to make small RNAs and use them to control gene expression. And one of the things that had been very interesting in the field was that there were no obvious homologs of many of the RNAi uh, enzymes to be found in bacteria. And so one of the reasons that I got interested in pursuing this in the beginning was that I thought that there might be some, some interesting parallels if this did turn out to be a bacterial immune system that would allow bacteria to um, control gene expression in a, in a fashion perhaps parallel to the way that eukaryotic cells are able to do it using small RNAs. So that was my initial sort of interest in this. And I certainly thought from the get-go that this would be a side project, maybe one or two people in my lab working on this, uh, never imagined that it would grow to the, to the kind of project that, that it now is, where I have more than half of my lab uh, working in this area. So to jump ahead then, so um, in 2007, there was a very interesting paper published in Science Magazine from a group uh, at the time at Danisco, a company that makes yogurt. And they were actually very interested in this possibility of a bacterial immune system because of the opportunity to defend their yogurt cultures against, against phage. And so they had been investigating the genetics of uh, a CRISPR system found in uh, an organism that is used in a yogurt culture. And they figured out uh, genetically that when they, were, when they made mutations in the CRISPR associated or Cas genes that were found in that uh, organism's uh, CRISPR locus, they could disrupt its ability to defend against uh, phage infections. And so this was the first evidence that, in fact, uh, CRISPR uh, loci are involved somehow in an uh, in, in immune system in bacteria. And what we now know is that organisms that have these loci have the ability to detect foreign DNA that gets into the cell. This could be through a phage infection, or it could be through a plasmid uh, transformation. They can excise small bits of DNA from these uh, foreign elements and insert them into uh, at one end of the CRISPR locus. And then the um, entire CRISPR locus is subsequently transcribed into RNA. And these uh, RNA transcripts are then processed into smaller unit length bits of RNA that each contain one of the sequences uh, shown in these green boxes corresponding to a, uh, in principle, to a phage or a plasmid. And that sequence information, together with proteins encoded in the adjacent genes, leads to the assembly of complexes capable of recognizing uh, the foreign DNA that has a sequence complementarity to the RNA in these complexes and uh, to the destruction of those DNA molecules. So this is a sort of an um, overview of what happens in, uh, in the biology of these systems. 
So, of course, we've been really keen to understand actually how this works from a, a molecular um, mechanism point of view. And so uh, what I want to talk to you about today is our work focusing really on the central part of this pathway, um, namely the, the uh, production and incorporation of RNA into complexes that lead to the destruction of foreign DNA molecules. And I want to tell you, I'll tell you about uh, some of our work on two different kinds of CRISPR systems and, and some of the interesting similarities and differences that we're finding in those, uh, in those different pathways. So uh, to show you in a little bit more detail what happens during the activation of the CRISPR system, we know from various studies in bacteria that uh, these CRISPR loci are transcribed typically as precursor molecules, so long strands of RNA that contain many of the individual uh, CRISPR repeats, these, these black sequences here, and very typically these sequences have the ability to fold back on themselves to form short uh, hairpin-like structures shown here. And it turns out that in a number of cases, and I won't, I won't go into this in detail, but we know from work in our own lab and, and from others that in a number of cases there are CRISPR-associated enzymes that are responsible for recognizing these sequences and cleaving them to generate the small RNAs that are actually functional in the system. So, um, you might notice that each of the mature CRISPR RNAs that are produced have uh, on their ends sequences derived from the repeats. So the ends of these RNAs are identical in every case, but the sequence in the center in the colored box corresponds to a unique sequence that can be used for to, to, uh, to actually base pair with a complementary sequence in double-stranded DNA. Now these RNAs don't function alone, they actually function in the context of proteins that assemble, and I see my protein blob is sort of washed out here, but, um, but there are proteins there um, that assemble with these RNAs, and it's those RNA protein complexes that are actually capable of recognizing complementary sequences in double-stranded DNA. And quite interestingly, um, from, from fairly early on, there was evidence that these systems almost exclusively recognize double-stranded DNA targets. So unlike RNA interference in eukaryotic cells where the target is single-stranded uh, messenger RNA, here the target is double-stranded DNA. And so one of the fascinating mechanistic questions is how is it that these uh, RNA protein complexes are able to identify sequences in double-stranded DNA and lead to um, degradation of DNA, typically by initiating a double-stranded break in the DNA at the site of complementarity with the CRISPR RNA sequence. And I want to talk today about how, how we have approached trying to understand how that actually works. So one of the cool things about CRISPR systems is that there is uh, not just one of these, but, but in fact many. And so this is actually a figure taken from uh, a paper published by Makarova and her colleagues in 2011, in which what her lab did was to look at uh, all of the different CRISPR sequences that were available at that time and, um, and the associated proteins. And what you're looking at here is a family tree showing uh, different sets of CRISPR-associated or Cas proteins that are found in the, in, uh, in the context of different CRISPR loci in various kinds of bacteria. And um, by looking at the similarities of some of these uh, proteins and the types of proteins that they might be similar to in terms of function, Makarova was able to, sh to uh, I think, show rather nicely that the, one could take this, what looks like sort of a large mess here of different differences and, 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 and very divergent sequences, and show that, in fact, um, one could classify them into three major subtypes. And so this is now uh, the way that we think about these CRISPR systems, is really in the context of three major different uh, subtypes that include uh, a large set, type 1, that, that involve uh, many, many uh, proteins, typically, that, that come together uh, and, and that have to function together to generate the, uh, a functional immune system, versus uh, the type 2 systems that I'll talk about uh, in, in the talk today as well, that, that include many fewer proteins, and in fact, just a single protein that is responsible for actually employing the sequence information in the CRISPR RNA to cut uh, double-stranded DNA. 
So, uh, so I want to talk about both our, our work on, on both of these uh, types of CRISPR systems. And I'm, I'm going to tell you just uh, fairly briefly about some of the work that has been done recently in our lab to, on, on uh, these so-called type 1 uh, systems. And I think that the sort of the underlying property of, of the type 1 systems that seems to be true for uh, looking at these systems in a number of different kinds of bacteria now is that in all cases they seem to uh, involve large multi-protein complexes that assemble with a CRISPR RNA and, um, and recruit a separate enzyme, uh, which is typically called Cas3, as the nuclease to cleave double-stranded DNA. So these are um, multi-component systems that require a number of proteins to assemble together with the RNA to actually carry out double-stranded DNA recognition and then recruit this separate enzyme to cut the DNA. And so um, in, in some work that was published a couple of years ago now uh, in, in collaboration with my colleague Evan Ogallis at Berkeley and, and was a wonderful a collaboration between a postdoc in my lab, Blake Wiedenheft, and a postdoc in Eva's lab, uh, Gabe Lander. So these two guys were able to work together to determine an 8 angstrom uh, cryo-EM reconstruction of the uh, targeting complex that occurs in the CRISPR system from E. coli and, and organisms that have uh, this type of complex. And so um, this work, this, uh, the identification of this complex initially was done by uh, the John Vanderos lab in Wageningen University, and they showed that in E. coli and bugs that have a similar uh, type of CRISPR locus, there are five genes called Cas A through E that encode polypeptides that assemble together with a single copy of CRISPR RNA to form the, the complex that is capable of recognizing double-stranded DNA. And they called this, uh, this complex Cascade. And I have a, I think this will, I can get this to rotate for you, yes. And so as this comes around, um, I want to just point out some of the, the uh, properties of this complex. So um, the Cas E protein is the enzyme that cuts the, the CRISPR RNA and generates these unit length molecules. So it's shown in red and it actually remains bound to the RNA hairpin here, this uh, portion of the RNA at the, at the three prime end, and uh, remains bound to that hairpin, which is right here. And you can see the gray of the RNA running uh, down the length of this complex and ending up down here at the bottom. And the RNA is actually held in place by six copies of the Cas C protein in blue that cradle this, this RNA and actually uh, present it, we think, for recognition of double-stranded DNA. And then down here at the bottom are single copies of the Cas A and D proteins, and then two copies here of the Cas B protein. So it's a very um, interesting complex that has this unequal uh, stoichiometry. We know that it's about, a, it's about a 400 kilodalton complex. We know that all 11 subunits in the complex, as well as the separate Cas3 protein, are actually essential for uh, immunity to phage in, in bugs that have this type of a, a CRISPR system. So, uh, you know, we've been really keen to go from that structure to understanding how does it actually interact with double-stranded DNA, and then how does it recruit the Cas3 nuclease to cleave the DNA. And so um, in some very recent work done by three students in the lab, David Taylor, uh, Megan Hochstrasser, and Prashant Bhatt, who he's actually, Prashant is actually an undergraduate uh, student at Berkeley. So these three have teamed up to generate complexes of, the, of uh, Cascade that include um, not only the components that I just showed you, but also uh, a double-stranded DNA target um, and ultimately also the, the Cas3 endonuclease. So initially what uh, Prashant and Megan did was to prepare samples of Cascade that contained this double-stranded uh, DNA molecule shown right here that has a target sequence um, highlighted in color in the, in the center that is complementary to the targeting sequence in the CRISPR RNA that we loaded into Cascade. And so we can make uh, complexes of, uh, of Cascade that contain this double-stranded DNA, and, and, um, and uh, these are, this is just a raw uh, EM image of what those samples look like. And then um, they actually are, are nicely behaved such that we can assemble uh, individual particles into various class averages uh, 
that show the particle in different orientations and then use that for a three-dimensional reconstruction. And so this um, now shows a very uh, preliminary reconstruction by David Taylor of the target bound form of the cascade complex. And so what you might notice is that, so you can see the overall shape of the complex, but now the portion in the center where the guide RNA is located is, we see a lot more density there corresponding to this dark uh, blue color. And uh, furthermore, we noticed that we could actually see density down here at the base of the complex that uh, corresponds to the double helical end of the DNA as it enters the complex. And you can actually see the groove of the DNA as it uh, corkscrews into the, the base of this cascade complex. And then we think at that point opens up to allow base pairing of one of the strands with the, uh, the guide RNA sequence. And so then uh, uh, using, using that uh, complex at, for comparison, um, David Taylor was then able to also generate a complex of this, uh, of the cascade uh, sample bound to the endonuclease Cas3. And this, I have to say, was a very, uh, you know, one of those sort of frustrating projects where it took a lot of effort to generate a, a functional form of the Cas3 protein, verify that it was actually uh, catalytically active, could cut DNA nicely. It only cuts DNA in the presence of the cascade complex. So this is an endonuclease that relies on DNA targeting by cascade to actually be a functional uh, enzyme in terms of its ability to cleave DNA. And, and um, in these reconstructions that you're looking at here, the Cas3 protein was actually cross-linked very lightly to the cascade uh, complex so that we can actually visualize density corresponding to Cas3 at the base of the complex down here. So we think now that probably this protein is sitting uh, here adjacent to the portion of the uh, place in the complex where the DNA actually opens up and, and is able to uh, base pair with the targeting portion of the RNA. And then this is just a cutaway view showing you just the um, density corresponding to the DNA where it enters the cascade complex. This uh, purple density is the Cas A protein, which we, uh, Deepa Sashital, a former postdoc in the lab, solved a crystal structure for. And so you're looking at those uh, models here in the EM density. And then on the right-hand side, this is where we see the Cas3 enzyme located. And the dotted line indicates the path of the DNA, and we think this is actually the way that the, the, one of the strands of the DNA opens up and then is able to pair with the CRISPR RNA in the complex. And one of the things that we're working on currently with this is to try to, uh, we're putting various labels into the DNA so that we can actually visualize the path of the DNA in this complex. Um, so one of the things that, you know, so for the first uh, several years that we worked on, on CRISPR systems in the lab, we were very focused on these type 1 systems and how they operate and how, the, how these uh, large complexes assemble. And, um, and what I want to do now is tell you about a, a very uh, interesting parallel type of CRISPR system uh, characterized uh, by these type 2 systems that involves not a large multi-protein complex for DNA targeting, but actually just a single protein that functions as a programmable nuclease to cut uh, DNA in, when guided to a sequence by a uh, CRISPR uh, RNA. And so the way that we got into this was uh, I, I had gone to a, con a conference in 2011, and I met uh, Emmanuel Charpentier at that meeting. And she is a medical microbiologist who was working in Sweden at the time. And her lab had very recently been investigating uh, the sort of RNAs that are abundant in a human pathogen called strep pyogenes. And in a whole uh, transcriptome sequencing experiment that they had done, they kind of stumbled across a very abundant transcript or set of transcripts in strep pyogenes corresponding to uh, these sequences right here that uh, turned out to be complementary or to, to, to contain sequence that is complementary to the repeats in the CRISPR locus of this organism. And, uh, and so that drew her attention to the CRISPR system in strep pyogenes. And through a very um, nice set of experiments, 
she and her lab were able to show that in this organism, in this type of CRISPR system, what happens is that uh, after the initial CRISPR transcript is made from the repetitive locus, this sequence here, which they called transactivating or tracer RNA, these RNAs are able to base pair with that precursor transcript to generate short segments of double-stranded RNA that become substrates for the host ribonuclease 3 enzyme, which is an enzyme that very interestingly is, is uh, in the same family as the Dicer enzyme that generates uh, um, small RNAs during RNA interference in eukaryotes. And anyway, so in, in bacteria, this RNAs3 uh, protein cleaves these double-stranded RNA substrates to generate ultimately the mature CRISPR RNAs that are actually employed by strep pyogenes as a defense mechanism. And so they had published this, this work, and in the, pro, in the course of doing this work, they had also um, become aware of genetic information suggesting that, uh, that only one of the four Cas proteins in this, uh, in this uh, organism, a, a gene, a protein, uh, had the, a gene that had been called Cas9, was genetically required for CRISPR function. And so when we met at this conference, she said, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very interested that in contrast to the type 1 CRISPR systems that have all these proteins that are necessary for targeting, it looks like in this type of CRISPR uh, system, maybe only one protein is necessary, and we'd love to understand uh, what its function is. And so this was really the, the question that we set out to address collaboratively was, what, what is Cas9 actually doing? And so I came back to my lab at Berkeley, and um, I had a wonderful postdoc uh, in the lab who had really one more year before he was um, going to leave for a faculty position. This was Martin Jinek. And so I approached Martin and said, you know, would you like to, to, to play around with the system? And he said, yeah, sure, you know. And so uh, he started uh, generating uh, samples of the purified Cas9 protein. And in collaboration with Christoph Chylinski, a student in Emanuel's lab, the two of them were able to show that Cas9 is actually a dual RNA-guided uh, double-stranded DNA cleaving enzyme. And the way that it, that it works is really quite, quite remarkable. So the, uh, the protein um, is able to bind to a CRISPR RNA sequence, which is this, uh, this uh, sequence right here with the yellow box. And the yellow box is the part of the sequence that actually does uh, the DNA targeting. But very importantly, this uh, CRISPR RNA doesn't function alone in Cas9. It actually is essential that it form a structure with the tracer RNA, which is this red sequence here, the RNA that was essential for maturation of the CRISPR RNA in the first place. They, uh, these two RNAs remain associated, and they actually recruit the Cas9 protein and, um, and then allow that protein to be targeted to a particular sequence in double-stranded DNA that's complementary to the guide RNA in the CRISPR uh, transcript here. And when that happens, then there are two molecular blades within the Cas9 enzyme that are each able to cut one of the strands of uh, DNA right in the region that is paired to the CRISPR RNA like this to generate a double-stranded break uh, in the DNA. And so Martin was able to, um, uh, you know, sort of if you look down here at the bottom of the slide, this is now showing uh, the, the um, complex that forms when Cas9 is actually engaged on a double-stranded DNA target. Namely, um, it's got four strands of nucleic acid. We've got the two strands of DNA right here. Here's the target sequence. And then there's the two RNAs, the CRISPR RNA that has the guide sequence in it right here, and then the tracer RNA that allows it to form a structure that can recruit the Cas9 protein to that site. And so Martin was able to whittle away at these uh, ends of these RNAs and trim it down to a, a more minimal sequence that was still functional biochemically. And it's a little bit uh, washed out here, but it's in this portion of the sort of this blue box part of the sequence. So we knew that just this part of these two RNAs was really essential for function. And there was sort of a key moment when Martin was in my lab, in, in my office, and we were talking about these data, and uh, he had sort of drawn a sketch like this up on my whiteboard, and we looked at this and we said, you know, actually, uh, we could probably generate a single uh, RNA that would have all of these capabilities by, by just 
uh, connecting the ends of these two molecules by a, by a short linker sequence or tetraloop to look something like, like this. So it's sort of the, the idea of a single guide. And um, we, we were actually, you know, we, I, I, I sort of remember this moment very clearly because we were both at this point already thinking that, you know, if this system could be shown to work in eukaryotic cells, it could actually be a very efficient way to generate uh, double-stranded breaks in DNA at, at essentially any site that you programmed it to, to recognize. And it could be a very useful tool for the kinds of genome engineering experiments that people were already doing with uh, programmable proteins, like talon uh, proteins and zinc finger nucleases, except that here we would have a single protein capable of cutting uh, DNA by simply changing the guide RNA uh, sequence that it contained. So uh, we tested this idea, and so Martin was able to um, get a, he got a, a plasmid uh, from uh, Barbara Meyer's lab at Berkeley encoding GFP and designed five different guide RNAs that could recognize sequences on either strand of the, the coding sequence in this, in, this, uh, in this gene. And importantly, these are all adjacent to a short motif, a GG uh, dinucleotide motif that we had uh, determined to be a, uh, very important for, for target recognition by uh, Cas9. And then Martin was able to show that um, by programming Cas9 with these five different guide RNAs, he could get very efficient cutting of plasmid DNA and furthermore, by cutting the DNA uh, just with a restriction site that cut just upstream of this region so that each of these uh, fragments was doubly cut by this uh, site, uh, this restriction enzyme here, and then each of these uh, targeted sites by Cas9. And you probably can't, I don't know if you can see this, but, um, but basically the fragments released by double cutting the plasmid in this way were each corresponded to the sizes of fragments that we expected based on the programmed site of Cas9 cleavage. So uh, at this point, we knew that we had a, a programmable enzyme and that to, uh, to get this to cut double-stranded DNA, you basically had to have not only the guide RNAs present, either in the form of the, the dual RNAs that nature uses or a single guide in which these ends were connected, um, but you also had to have a roughly 20 base pair sequence in DNA complementary to the guide sequence in the RNA adjacent to a uh, little motif called a PAM, which for this enzyme is a GG uh, dinucleotide. And if those, um, those things were true, then we could get very efficient cutting, uh, double-stranded uh, break generation in DNA using this kind of a system. So uh, we published this work in the summer of 2012. And, um, and we immediately uh, you know, began doing experiments to try to test whether we could port this into uh, eukaryotic cells. We, you know, did the things that you, you might imagine. So, you know, put, put a nuclear localization signal onto Cas9 so that it would be able to get into the nucleus of eukaryotic cells and generated artificial genes encoding Cas9 that would be codon optimized for expression in, in uh, human cells, which is the system that, that uh, Martin was using for this. And, of course, um, you, you, you probably know that uh, this uh, turned out to be um, really quite a, an amazing thing because at the same time that we were doing those experiments, of course, other people were getting on, involved as well. And what we saw in uh, the first part of 2013 was a whole series of publications that came out that showed that, in fact, Cas9 can be used to um, do, make targeted changes in the genomes of a variety of different kinds of cells and whole organisms in uh, a re in, in a, often a, a quite efficient way. So um, this was done initially with human cells and also uh, with mouse cells in, in mice and rats and zebrafish, uh, yeast bacteria, flies. I don't have plants on here, but I should. And, and, um, and basically, um, at this point, uh, there have been a, a large number of uh, uh, proof of principle papers that have shown that, in fact, uh, Cas9 works very well to generate double-stranded breaks in a targeted fashion that cells can then repair using uh, various repair mechanisms, non-homologous enjoining or homologous recombination to introduce site-specific changes in uh, genomes. So that sort of took the CRISPR uh, system and the whole CRISPR field from being a very obscure, kind of interesting hobby kind of project to being suddenly something that um, a lot of people were, were uh, 
uh, drawn to because of the potential for uh, this to be a, an important kind of gene, genome uh, manipulating uh, tool. So, uh, so what are we doing uh, now? So really what we're keen to do at this point uh, is to really understand how it is that uh, this can work uh, the way that it does. And um, in particular, uh, we've been keen to answer this question here. Uh, how is it that these Cas9 RNA complexes are able to find and efficiently cleave target sites within the vast you know, volumes of, of genomic uh, DNA? And so up until this point, we've been doing biochemical experiments using either plasmid uh, DNA or even uh, small uh, DNA oligos as substrates. And, um, I think it was uh, sometime in, in uh, early part of 2012 that we had a, a seminar visit from Eric Green of Columbia University at Berkeley. And Eric uh, came and uh, talked about his work with uh, what he calls DNA curtains, which are namely single molecules of phage lambda genomic DNA that he is using to visualize various kinds of um, polymerases and other, kind, other uh, and, and repair enzymes that can access DNA and move along DNA processively, locate particular sites in the DNA, et cetera. And so uh, we saw this seminar, and in particular, Sam uh, Sternberg, a, a graduate student in the lab, said, you know, that would be a wonderful system to, you know, use with these CRISPR complexes, because this is exactly what they have to do, is deal with phage DNA and find individual sites within that DNA for cutting. So um, just to, just to um, sort of show you what these DNA curtains look like that the Green Lab prepares, they can uh, tether these DNA molecules either singly or doubly on slides, and they don't do it randomly, they actually do it in an ordered fashion. So these molecules are all lined up, hence the, hence the name curtain. And then they're visualized with a, uh, an intercalating dye so that we can see these individual molecules and observe the behavior of proteins that might interact with the DNA by um, labeling these proteins, typically with a quantum dot, so that they can be uh, looked at using a laser in a process called turf microscopy. So uh, we initiated a collaboration with Eric, and, um, and Sam Sternberg, the, uh, the student from my lab, went to New York City in the summer of 2012 to start uh, looking at the behavior of CRISPR complexes on these DNA curtains. And the first experiment that he wanted to do was to uh, investigate the ability of in this case, uh, Cas9 RNA complexes programmed with guide RNAs that would allow the, the, the protein to recognize different sites along the length of lambda DNA and just uh, look to see whether we could actually observe um, visually the localization of these complexes at these programmed sites. So uh, I'll show you uh, what some of these uh, data actually look like. Um, this is an experiment in which the lambda DNA is tethered on just one end. So it's tethered on this uh, side of the slide. And then we have a buffer that is flowing from top to bottom across the, the slide. And um, you're watching toggling between flow turned on and then flow off as there. And when the flow is on, these molecules are extended. When the flow is a buffer is turned off, these molecules uh, snap back up to the origin. So, um, and the purpose for this is so that we can actually see where the um, quantum dot labeled Cas9 molecules, which you're seeing in magenta, are actually lining up along the DNA. And of course, there's some other dots here too, but when you uh, compare what happens when the DNA snaps back up to the origin, you can actually see that many of these uh, quantum dot uh, labeled Cas9 complexes are, are actually associated with the DNA and they're associated at a site that we expect this complex to be able to recognize. And then Sam was able to uh, quantify this by looking at many individual events and plot them out and show that um, we see very nice localization of this complex at the expected site along the length of the DNA and if you do this with multiple different uh, programmed complexes, you can actually observe um, a plot that looks like this. And so this is really kind of a control, right? So it just sort of tells us that this is an assay that is, 
is um, um, useful for us in terms of visualizing how these complexes localize along the DNA. And so then with that tool in hand, Sam and Cy Redding, a student in Eric's lab, teamed up to start asking uh, functional questions about how this targeting actually works. And so uh, one of the first things that they noticed was that when Cas9 associates with a, uh, a bona fide target site in the lambda DNA, these binding events are typically very long-lived, right? So we see some um, quantum dot blinking, and that's what you're seeing here. But effectively, these uh, uh, binding events show that Cas9 gets onto a target site, and then it basically never lets go during the time course of the experiment. And um, what was very interesting was that when they started doing these experiments, they were using inactive and inactivated version of Cas9 in which the catalytic centers were mutated so that we, because they didn't want to just see the DNA immediately getting cleaved. And when they went back and did the same experiment with a wild type active version of Cas9, they got the same result. So both of these, both the uh, inactive and wild type forms of Cas9 looked um, identical. And so we thought that, well, you know, one possibility was that the Cas9 enzyme was somehow inactive in this kind of a setup. Or another uh, more interesting possibility was that perhaps uh, the Cas9 protein actually is active here in cutting the DNA, but then stays very tightly associated with the cleaved ends of the DNA molecule. And so um, to test this possibility, uh, we did a couple of different experiments in the single molecule setup that are summarized here. So one, one experiment, which is shown here on the left, was to um, load these DNA curtains with a Cas9 complex that could bind at a particular site here. And then, uh, and this is using the wild type active uh, version of Cas9. And then um, when, uh, to, to determine whether there was actually a cleavage event that occurred that might involve very tightly associated product strands with the Cas9 complex, the buffer in this case was modified to include a very high concentration of salt that would dissociate any protein that might remain uh, bound to the DNA. And so what you can see here is that when we use that, uh, that kind of a more denaturing buffer, we now see that many of these DNA curtains actually, these uh, DNA molecules actually get cut. So the curtain is cut um, at the site uh, that we predict. And then furthermore, over here on the right-hand panel shows an experiment in which, in this case, the DNA is doubly tethered on both the top and the bottom. We have Cas9 uh, bound to a target sequence here. And initially, the, the, uh, the buffer is, uh, flow is not turned on. So you see stable association of this complex with the DNA. And then when we turn on the buffer flow, again, this is a buffer that's been modified to have a high co salt concentration. At a, at a po certain point in time, this uh, molecule cuts the DNA. And when it, when it does, what you now see is that this uh, DNA swings down and is dangling down here um, with the protein associated with the, uh, the broken end of the double-stranded DNA. So both of those kinds of experiments really suggested that, in fact, this is a complex that stays very tightly associated with the cleaved ends of the DNA. And that conclusion was supported by uh, some bulk assays that Sam did varying the ratio of Cas9 RNA complexes to DNA substrate. And what he found in those experiments was that we observed stoichiometric cleavage of DNA. In other words, there's no turnover of this complex. It binds the DNA and cuts it and then remains bound to the product. So there's no release of product and binding of a new uh, substrate. And uh, right, and then these are just control uh, experiments showing that um, if we run these products on a denaturing polyacrylamide gel, we actually see cutting of the DNA. But if we run it on a non-denaturing polyacrylamide gel, we see that uh, these complexes remain assembled. So um, really supporting the idea that this is a, a protein that, at least under these sorts of biochemical conditions, does not turn over on the DNA. So um, the other kind of binding event that was very um, interesting in these sorts of assays was, was uh, nonspecific binding. In other words, um, events that occurred at non-target sites, sites that were not complementary to the guide RNA. And in those cases, what we found was that these events tended to be very transient. 
on the DNA, not long lived like uh, bona fide uh, target site recognition. And what was also very intriguing was that when we plotted out where these uh, seemingly nonspecific binding events occurred along the length of the lambda uh, DNA genome, um, what we found was that there was an overabundance of these nonspecific events on one end of the genome. And that turns out to be um, uh, just, you know, coincidentally, a portion of the lambda genome that is more GC rich than the rest of the sequence. And that led to the um, uh, idea that perhaps these nonspecific binding events might actually be specific for PAM sequences, the GG dinucleotide that I mentioned, which is uh, critical for target recognition by Cas9. And this is just showing a plot that's, you know, not, not terribly convincing, but shows that there's a sort of at least a non-random correspondence of these binding events with uh, portions of the sequence that are, uh, that have higher uh, GC content. And so that led uh, Sam to do another set of experiments, uh, this time again, bulk assay biochemical experiments, in which he used a competition, uh, set of competition experiments to test whether uh, uh, Cas9 was really interacting with uh, PAM sequences in double-stranded DNA. And the way this kind of assay works is that we have a radio-labeled substrate DNA here that has a target sequence and a PAM motif, and then we use programmed Cas9 to cleave the DNA and generate these, uh, these products. And then we can also add competitor DNA, which is not radio-labeled, into the complex and look, uh, basically ask whether this competitor DNA can compete for this, for binding of this substrate and inhibit uh, cutting of the radio-labeled DNA. And so if we do this kind of assay um, just with uh, using a target, bona fide uh, target DNA sequence and a cold competitor of the same sequence, we see that the higher the competitor comp uh, concentration, the more competition we get and the less cleavage we get of the radio-labeled DNA. So that just shows how the assay works. And then the experiment was to take, uh, make a series of competitor DNA molecules that um, had either no tar so none of these competitor DNAs had any target complementarity, so they couldn't in principle base pair with the guide uh, RNA sequence in Cas9. And furthermore, they had either no PAM sequences at all, as in this example, or increasing numbers of GG dinucleotide motifs. And the question was, were any of these um, function, you know, did any of these work well as, as uh, competitors of the DNA cleavage reaction? And what we found was that uh, basically the more, uh, the, the higher the density of PAM sequences in the DNA, the better it functioned as a competitor in these reactions. So this is showing that when, you, when we have a DNA molecule that has no uh, PAM sequences, it really doesn't compete uh, well at all in this kind of a reaction, but the more, the, you know, the more, uh, the higher the density of PAMs in the competitor, the more competition we observed. And here's the result that I think is really the most uh, telling in this kind of experiment. It's, it w is an experiment with this competitor right here, where we have a DNA that now has, now looks exactly like the DNA substrate, but it has a single point mutation in one of the G uh, uh, nucleotides of the PAM motif. And that DNA functions just like this one as a competitor. It's basically not seen by the enzyme. So it really suggests that this, uh, the mechanism of target recognition involves fundamentally recognition of a PAM motif by Cas9. And only then does it interrogate the adjacent DNA to see if there's complementarity to the guide RNA. So I think that helps to start, get, you know, to explain how this protein can sift through the vastness of genomic DNA fairly quickly to find a, a bona fide target site. And this is just showing, oh, the, okay, so this is one more uh, biochemical experiment that I think is very um, interesting, which shows that uh, this is just showing, um, uh, again, the importance of the, the PAM motif for, for target cleavage. And, and so what you're looking at here is cleavage of a, a double-stranded DNA sequence, as I've been showing you, that gets uh, cleaved by the Cas9 complex. And then if we do the same experiment but use a single-stranded DNA that is complementary to the guide RNA but does not have a, a partner strand, so it's a single strand, this is actually not 
uh, cut by Cas9. So it's really not a substrate for Cas9. And then what Sam did in these assays was to then start adding back short uh, DNA oligos that uh, could bind upstream of the target sequence and eventually uh, base pair across the region that um, is uh, recognized as the PAM. And what he found was that as soon as he uh, included these PAM nucleotides, the GG uh, dinucleotide here, now that single-stranded DNA becomes a terrific substrate for Cas9 again. Right? So it really does suggest that there's, it's almost like there's an allosteric activation of the enzyme upon recognition of the GG dinucleotide. So what I want to do in the last uh, few minutes is to tell you uh, where we're going in terms of understanding structurally how this enzyme is able to, to operate. And so um, Martin Janek, uh, you know, is a, is a great crystallographer. And he actually, when we initiated the collaboration with Emmanuel uh, Charpentier, one of, our, one of our goals was wouldn't it be great if we could actually get a structure of, of Cas9. And so very recently, uh, Martin, uh, uh, in a project that was started uh, with, in our lab and then finished up in his own lab at University of Zurich, uh, has been able to determine a, a crystal structure of Cas9. Um, at, uh, and, and this is a, a structure of the protein in its APO form, in other words, in the absence of bound nucleic acids. So we think this is kind of how, how, how things start off, is with the, uh, the protein before it's uh, associated with either a guide RNA or double-stranded DNA. And so what you're seeing here is at the top a cartoon diagram of the protein. And um, we knew from looking at this, uh, just even the cartoon uh, diagram here, that um, there were going to be some interesting topological properties to the protein because there are three motifs, uh, rov C1, 2, and 3 in blue boxes here, that all have to come together to form one of the active sites of this enzyme. And then the other active site is this one here in yellow, uh, corresponding to the HNH uh, nuclease domain. And then a number of other uh, you know, sequences, a large uh, uh, sequence here that initially had no uh, homology to anything. So we didn't really know what it, what it might look like. And in fact, uh, I don't know how well you can see this structure here, but the two active sites are very close together in the three-dimensional structure. The rov C domain is here, kind of at the base of a cleft in the protein, and adjacent to it is the HNH nuclease domain. And we know that these two have to be able to uh, be positioned such that they can actually generate a double-stranded break in uh, the bound uh, DNA substrate molecule when this, when this is actually associated on a substrate. Um, the, this large uh, sequence here is actually all alpha helical, so it forms a very big, uh, we call it the alpha helical lobe, that um, is likely to be the binding site for the, at least part of the guide RNA, probably the, the handle part that's important for, for assembly with the complex. And then I want to just point out down here uh, uh, what we think is a hinge uh, sequence in the protein that is um, very um, ch highly charged and uh, where there are mutants that affect um, uh, DNA targeting, point mutations in this region. So there's some I think, circumstantial evidence that this is going to turn out to be a functionally very important uh, part of the protein. And I want to just uh, show you now uh, one uh, biochemical experiment that, that I thought was sort of a very interesting way that, that we were able to start thinking about the structure and what it might tell us about function. And that was a set of experiments that were done by Amin Kaya, a, uh, a postdoc in the lab, together with Sam, uh, in which they were able to put cross-linking groups on the nucleotides adjacent to the PAM sequence in a model DNA substrate for Cas9, cross-link it to the protein, and then proteolize the protein and map the cross-linked peptides to each of these sites. And initially, uh, we were doing these experiments before the crystal structure had been solved. And so we had these peptide sequences, and they both had uh, tryptophans in them, which was very interesting. But we uh, didn't know where these would sit in the context of the folded protein until we had the structure. And once the structure was solved, it was clear that both of these cross-linked peptides map to two loops that are interestingly disordered in the structure. And they sit right below this, uh, this uh, sequence that I just pointed out, which we think is a potential hinge uh, in the structure, this purple uh, region right here. And so 
uh, we have these two loops that are actually fairly close together in 3D space but are disordered. And you can start to imagine how this might actually function, right? It starts off uh, in a disordered state in, the, in terms of the PAM binding pocket and perhaps only becomes ordered upon association with a bona fide uh, target sequence. Um, and these are just uh, experiments showing that if we make mutations in one or the other of these tryptophans, uh, we see a very minimal effect on DNA cutting by Cas9. But if we mutate both of those uh, uh, sites in the protein, now we see essentially no cleavage of the DNA. And in more recent uh, data that we have, we know this is actually a binding effect. So this, these uh, mutants no longer are able to bind to DNA. So again, it's sort of consistent with this idea that you have these loops that start off in a dynamic state that are able to interrogate DNA and then become ordered, presumably, upon binding to a bona fide uh, PAM sequence. Um, I don't want to go over too much. I'm just going to very quickly summarize uh, some uh, uh, EM data that has been uh, a, a wonderful, again, collaboration with Evan Agalis' laboratory and work done by uh, David Taylor and, and Sam Sternberg, two students in the lab, in which they've been able to visualize Cas9 in its APO form, so the unliganded form, and then in complex with RNA alone or RNA and DNA by negative stain EM. So these are very, you know, sort of modest resolution kinds of uh, reconstructions. And I'll just cut to the bottom line here. Um, and they've also been able to do uh, labeling of the, the DNA molecules with biotin so that we can see kind of where the ends of the DNA are, are ending up in the complex. And to summarize sort of all of our conclusions from, from all of that, we basically think that um, I think there's very nice evidence that Cas9 rearranges upon association with these nucleic acid ligands um, to form a central channel that is occupied by the double-stranded DNA. And of course, uh, I think when this is actually bound there and associated with the CRISPR uh, guide RNA sequence, it's opened up, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't look uh, exactly like this. But these are uh, just showing you where the ends of the the RNAs in yellow and the ends of the DNAs in green end up in this fully loaded uh, kind of complex. And then if we rotate it, we can see, sort of look down the central axis, and you can see that the protein really has these two very clearly defined uh, uh, regions or domains that flank the central channel where the DNA substrate is binding. And so this, again, I think starts to give us some important clues about how this is actually uh, functioning when it associates with DNA. So, uh, so really, um, this is uh, essentially a sort of a summary slide here, just showing that, um, that we think that you know, the protein starts off in the APO state uh, without this obvious central channel present. And then upon associated, uh, association with the guide RNA, that, uh, at least according to our EM data, seems to trigger the, the major conformational rearrangement that puts it into a, 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 a complex uh, that has this central binding pocket that becomes occupied by DNA when the substrate is actually present. So um, I just want to sort of wrap up by saying that, um, you know, I think this is a turn for us has really, really turned into, you know, gone from a project that was just a sort of a fascination to something that um, is not only that, but really I think is uh, becoming a, um, a, 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 an interesting project from the perspective of using this as a tool in cells. And, for, for me, as a, you know, someone who's interested in molecular mechanisms, I'm very excited about not only understanding this and making it better as a tool, but I also think that it has a lot to offer to us in terms of thinking about how enzymes like this are able to access uh, DNA, how they handle the complex structure of chromatin, and how they might trigger recombination pathways in cells and understand you know, how, that, how that interaction occurs. I think that's, that's all going to be uh, very interesting and certainly will keep us and others uh, busy for, for quite some time. So um, I'd like to just close by acknowledging wonderful people in the group that have uh, worked with us on various aspects of, of what I talked about today. Uh, and in particular, I want to mention Sam Sternberg, a student in our lab, Cy Redding, a graduate student in Eric Green's lab at Columbia. So these guys uh, really did a great job with all of the single molecule work that I showed you, as well as some of the bulk assays done by Sam. Um, and then Martin Jinek, who uh, was the person that, that really kicked off the Cas9 project in our lab,
is a wonderful biochemist and structural biologist and is continuing to investigate the mechanism of Cas9 now in his own lab at the University of Zurich. And then uh, finally, our collaborators, Emmanuel, her student, Christoph, Evan Ogalis, my colleague at Berkeley, and then our uh, two of the folks in my lab that are uh, very actively working on some of the structural biology of uh, Cas9. And I'll stop there and uh, happy to take questions if you have them. Thanks a lot. Right, so I don't know if everybody heard that. He's asking, how long does the target DNA sequence uh, need to be? How long is it naturally? And then how um, tolerant is it to mutations within that sequence? So there's been a lot of um, interest in this, of course, uh, not only fundamentally, but also for, for the, from the perspective of applications. And what we know is that uh, biologically, at least for this Cas9, the target site is 20 base pairs in length, plus the PAM. So it's really you know, sort of 22. And uh, and then there's a spacing requirement with the PAM. Um, and from uh, work that we've done in collaboration with David Liu and also done by Keith Jung, and there have been others that have investigated the, the um, tolerance of the system to mismatches, what we know is that I think very consistently the, what, what we and others have seen is that the first 12 base pairs of the DNA that are closest to the PAM, that base pair with the guide RNA sequence, are most essential for targeting. So, mutations in that region are very poorly tolerated, whereas mutations farther down away from the PAM are, um, are, 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 you know, are more easily tolerated by the system, right? And so one of the things that, that is certainly of interest to do, and I heard a little bit about this from um, a conversation they had today, is uh, to look at both other naturally occurring Cas9s that have different, some of them have uh, different uh, lengths of, a t of target sequence that they look at, as well as to think about uh, engineering Cas9s that might have more specificity. And then, of course, there's approaches that other labs have employed uh, using Cas9 as a NICACE, where you now require two independent recognition events to cut out a piece of DNA. So I think there's various ways that people are thinking about working with the properties of Cas9 to make it a system that will be appropriate for, for engineering. I have two very different questions. One is uh, what's going on in our kids, and the other, what are the prospects for engineering Cas9s with different PAMs? Yeah. So you can target any other side. Right. So those are both great questions. So he's asking, what about uh, in archaeal organisms? What's very interesting, and I don't know the reason for this biologically, but there aren't any known examples, or at least that I'm aware of, of type 2 systems with Cas9 in archaea. I don't know why that is. They seem to be only occurring in, in bacterial organisms. Um, archaea have, are actually have, you know, many, many archaea have, uh, have CRISPR systems, and um, they all seem to be of the other types, not, Cas2, not, not type 2. So why that is, I don't know. Um, and, then, and then regarding uh, could we engineer Cas9 or find other ca Cas9s that look at other kinds of PAMs? Absolutely. I mean, nature has already done this, right? So there's a lot of... Uh, Cas9 variants that clearly recognize different PAM sequences. And some of those have already been published upon, but you know, there's many more to look at. And now I think you know, one of the things that we would love to be able to do eventually with this kind of um, work that I showed you towards the end of the talk is if we can really understand how PAM recognition is working, maybe we can either engineer it to, to have a different specificity, weaken or, or loosen the specificity, um, or at least um, make very targeted mutations in the protein that would allow us to select for Cas9s so that would have other specificities. So I think all of those things are, are, are possible. That was absolutely terrific. And, and I was wondering, the, the target site selection problem, you, you stress the importance, the importance of what's a quick base pairing uh, between the RNA and the and of course that uh, reminds somebody like me immediately of homologous recombination which involves uh, Watson-Crick base pairing between an incoming single strand uh, DNA 
double strand DNA. And one of the structural features is that DNA is stretched in that complex. And is the resolution of your target site selection complex sufficient to see if the RNA is actually stretched uh, in, in triplets similar to the way RAC A stretches single strand? Um, I, I, think, I think it will be. So we can't say yet for Cas9 because we just don't have the resolution in those EM uh, images that I showed you for Cas9. But what we do have is some uh, roughly eight angstrom reconstructions of the cascade complex with the CRISPR RNA plus a bound. We, we have it both with a bound single strand and we also have it with, now with a bound double stranded DNA. And what we see in both of those cases is very much like what you're saying, which is we see evidence that there are short segments of base pairing that occur between the guide RNA and the DNA, the bound DNA strand, then a kink, and then another short segment of base pairs. It's actually not three. It looks like it's more like four or five base pairs, then a kink, then four or five base pairs. And there's, uh, we've already, we, 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 we uh, published uh, on this uh, in a molecular cell paper uh, uh, last year, work from Deepa Sashital, using chemical probing to investigate that. And she sees very nice evidence from chemical protection for that same kind of binding mode. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be very, um, very um, analogous to what, what's been seen for Rec A. Yeah, I mean, he's asking you a great question. You're, you're, you're asking a really interesting question, which is, you know, what, what drives the opening of the double-stranded DNA, right? How do you really get strand invasion? How does that work? And um, the, the short answer is we just really don't know. But we, there's some things that, there's a few uh, things that, that we know about the process. One is it doesn't require ATP, right? So it's not energy requiring. Secondly, I think there's a really interesting hint um, from the EM work that we've done, both with the cascade complex as well as with Cas9 at lower resolution, suggesting that in both cases, what we see is that when the DNA binds, there's a big change in the conformation of these complexes, right? That, that occurs both for Cas9, but it also, I didn't show you this explicitly, but we, it was in the original paper on the cascade structures, that we see a very interesting conformational change when DNA binds. And so I suspect that um, there's going to be an interesting um, coupling between conformational change upon substrate association and uh, duplex opening, right? And that's something that's very testable in different ways. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're actively working on right now is to try to figure out how that works. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks very much.